Hi folks, I'm Dr. Jay Chapman. In this video, we'll briefly review the history of the national parks and the role geology and geologists have played in their creation. The national park system is a national treasure and widely believed to be one of America's best ideas, but it was controversial at the time and considered a radical idea when it was first proposed. Radical! It's a truly democratic and American idea or concept that some of the country's most majestic places should be available to everyone, not just landowners or the privileged and moneyed elite. The National Park Service has a two-part mission. First, make the parks accessible to all, and two, preserve the parks for future generations. These goals sometimes conflict with one another, and the number of visitors and lack of resources at some parks are threatening their preservation. The park story starts with Yosemite Valley in California and with Yellowstone in Wyoming. Yosemite Valley was discovered during the gold rush. Gold! Beautiful gold! And initially, developers hoped to make Yosemite into a tourist attraction. But there was widespread calls from the public to preserve Yosemite because um, they didn't want it to become another Niagara Falls. At the time, Niagara Falls was the United States' most famous natural landmark. But it was almost completely privately owned with hotels and shops on both shores and considered by many to be a national embarrassment that such an impressive natural feature could be despoiled by commercialization and privatization. Aw, oh, stupid commercials. So in 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill making Yosemite a state park, seeking to emulate Central Park in New York, which was a huge success and beloved by the public. Around the same time, early reports from pioneers and settlers were coming in about a fantastical place in the Wyoming Territory, where mud boiled, water and steam spouted from the ground, and the, the pungent smell of sulfur filled the air. Many folks thought these were Native American myths, and some newspapers refused to publish the reports, thinking that they were fiction. Life is stranger than fiction sometimes. It wasn't fiction, though. It was Yellowstone. Intrigued by these reports, the U.S. Geological Survey and the railroad companies sponsored expeditions to the region during the early 1870s. The USGS was looking for natural resources and the railroad companies were interested in building a second transcontinental railroad and wanted to find tourist attractions along the proposed route that could help increase the number of passengers. Come on, see the world! The USGS reported that there were no resources of economic value in Yellowstone, although this is before geothermal energy was considered a valuable resource. And with the backing of the railroad companies, President Ulysses S. Grant signed a bill making Yellowstone the first national park in 1872. Both Yellowstone and Yosemite were now parks, but they're a long cry from what you and I know as national parks today. Oh no, I ain't messing with you. At the time, there was no park infrastructure and no personnel to help protect the parks. Yellowstone became the railroad company's private resort, and they were cutting down trees and hunting wild game and growing crops to support the resort operations and visitors. I say, let them eat cake. Yosemite Valley was not much better. It was also exploited for lumber and sheep grazing and saw a boom in unregulated tourism. Both parks were plagued by poaching and vandalism. Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. Animals like the wild buffalo that were once abundant were now on the verge of extinction. By the end of the 1800s, the fledgling park system was in trouble, starting to break down and in danger of being completely abandoned. But there was a growing conservation movement in the United States, led by folks like John Muir. Muir had an undergraduate degree in geology. Someone came back with a degree that's useful. And a love for the California mountains. In the late 1880s, he was spending his summers as a sawmill operator in Yosemite Valley and cutting down trees to help build, among other things, illegal hotels and cabins in the valley. He was worried that Yosemite Valley might be ruined by these illegal commercial activities, and he started writing books and magazine and newspaper articles urging the preservation of Yosemite and other exceptional natural areas, while also discussing some of his theories on glacial erosion and the geologic history of Yosemite Valley. His writings were a huge success, and as a result of his and others' efforts, the public started demanding increased preservation. At first, the U.S. Army was moved into parks, like Yellowstone, to help protect it. These soldiers eventually evolved into the park rangers we know today. 
The national park system saw a dramatic expansion in the early 1900s during the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, who was an avid hunter and became an avid conservationist and a lifelong friend of John Muir. Roosevelt also signed the American Antiquities Act in 1906. Antique store, here we come. Which protects prehistoric cultures and prevents the disturbance of ruins and artifacts. At the time, many Native American sites had been discovered, but they were being looted and artifacts were being sold off to museums and private collectors. Many of these collectors were European, and there was a general anger in the United States about artifacts being shipped out of the country, perhaps never to be seen again. Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado was the first park created under the Antiquities Act and helped preserve some artifacts before they could be looted. To this day, the U.S. is still working to repatriate and return artifacts that were removed from Mesa Verde and similar sites. The Antiquities Act also gave the president the power to create national monuments without congressional approval. Presidential approval code zero, zero, destruct. And Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming was the first national monument created under the act. The creation of national monuments has remained contentious ever since. There's always tension between groups wishing to protect and preserve areas versus groups wishing to use natural resources. And many political battles have been fought over the creation of national parks and monuments. A recent such battle has been fought over Bears Ears National Monument in Utah that President Obama created in 2016. Similar battles have occurred over and over again throughout the history of the park system, including in places like the Grand Canyon, which in hindsight seems like a no-brainer to make into a national park. Each year, the park brings over $1 billion into the local economy. However, when the Grand Canyon was first made into a national monument in 1908, it infuriated local government officials, developers, miners, and ranchers. Another particularly acrimonious political fight surrounded Jackson Hole National Monument, which is now part of Grand Teton National Park. The expansion of the park was vehemently opposed by Wyoming ranchers and local politicians who compared the creation of the National Monument to Adolf Hitler's seizures of Austria, and they protested the new monument by herding cattle across the monument. When the monument was finally approved, Wyoming legislators were angry, and they pushed a bill through Congress reverting the National Monument land back to Forest Service land, which can be used by ranchers for grazing. But Franklin Roosevelt vetoed it. Yes, that's called a veto. Court battles followed and they raged on until 1950 when a compromise was reached that allowed the National Monument and Jackson to remain, but prevented any future presidents from using the Antiquities Act to create a new national park or national monument in Wyoming. Wyoming is the only state with this provision and it is also the reason why there will likely never be another national monument or national park in Wyoming. Once created, national parks and monuments may seem like they are protected forever. Forever! But there are many instances of parkland being converted into other uses. Notable examples include the construction of the Hetch Hetchy Dam and Reservoir in Yosemite, which was built to provide water to San Francisco for firefighting purposes after the 1906 earthquake. Another example is Olympic National Park, which was halved in size to increase lumber operations during World War I. The latest example of a park or monument being diminished in size is the aforementioned Bears Ears National Monument that President Trump reduced in size from over 2 million square miles to 315 square miles, the largest reduction in national monument size in park history. This action is being challenged in court, but is part of a centuries-old debate in the U.S. about the best use of public land and natural resources. Geologists have a critical role to play in this debate and they help inform and influence the decisions being made on the best use of our public lands. Hey, thanks for watching. Check out some more videos and share them with friends and family. Take care.